Hello everyone, my name is Nagarjun. So I'm currently working as like a scientist at Sana Biotechnology. Uh, I think I would start with a thank you note for the lab route uh, for, pro for providing this opportunity. Uh, it's my second talk at lab route. Um, yeah, so the, today's talk would be development of like potency assays for cell and gene therapy. So before I move on to the next slide, I want to really briefly introduce you to this picture here. So this picture actually captures most of the biological, uh, biological as pharmaceutical therapeutics around um, that has been applied as therapy, uh, as therapeutics. So you start with the, you look at the complexity, how it really grows. So you see a small molecule, and when you go start looking at a peptide, and then you go into an antibody to conjugate. Um, as you move on to like recombinant proteins and antibodies, they grow in size and the complexity grows. And as we talk about cell and gene, uh, right now you're looking at a virus particle here and cell itself is like around one micron. So you can understand how, how the complexity of these products have increased and like how much uh, kind of like analytical development is really required around these assays, around these products. So I just want to start uh, my presentation to giving like this confidential statement. Uh, the reason for this one is kind of like, so most of the data I'm presenting here, data are kind of like, uh, are individually from my knowledge that has been gained through literature. Uh, I don't have any confidential information in this presentation. It's just completely educational purpose only. So please, uh, it's kind of like my thoughts, uh, if you have any questions on like any of these, like uh, I'll be happy to, you know, uh, provide information where I get the information from, but like, yeah, don't take these information and like assume things are always right because literature changes and right now the literature, what I gain is, is at present time. So, okay, the overview of the talk would be like the outline of the talk would be really is to introduce, you know, cell and gene therapy products, which have been currently uploaded and what, what really cell and gene therapy uh, products are and really jump into how analytical method development is involved in drug product life cycle. And then you, like as the talk itself, mainly focused on potency assays. So I would love to introduce to FDA guidance for developing these potency assays and really talk about the challenges, like why potency assays are so challenging for cell and gene therapy products. And briefly touch on like two case studies. And I'll try to introduce like uh, one in gene therapy, one in cell therapy and how product, uh, how potency assays have been developed around it. And finally, the thoughts would be really to show some literature and talk about like where, how do you really, if you want, if you want to really develop a potency assay, uh, what's the way you should start looking at based on your analytical development? So that that will be my closing statement. So moving on. So as I said, cell and gene therapy products. So the image here pretty much shows you uh, two kinds of products, which is like a gene therapy product and a cell therapy product. So the image on the left-hand side, when you really look at like uh, the gene therapy product, what really uh, is kind of when we when we say direct delivery. So this can be a plasmid, this can be a viral vector. So right now we have the mRNA vaccines for COVID. These are also considered as kind of like uh, vaccines, uh, which almost mimic the gene therapy product. So what you ideally do is like you can use the plasmid itself as a product or you can actually uh, use a viral vector to carry your plasmid. So it can be ideally injected in vivo directly uh, to the specific site of your uh, region where you want to get your therapeutic region, uh, like the therapeutic effect, and then you kind of get your uh, efficacy. So when you look at like cell therapy products, uh, it's kind of like cell therapy right now. What we are seeing here is an example of a, a chimeric antigen T cell. 
but uh, in cell therapy you ideally have like an ipsc cell line terror products and and you start editing those to create your specific cells so a simple example would be you you use your specific trans gene or a specific uh, therapeutic gene you want to introduce that into the cells so you can use through a viral vector or you can use through a non-viral vector uh, which can be alteration or there are uh, other methods which uh, which are non-viral and once you create kind of your specific cell through this transduction process you kind of like grow them up and get your enough quantity and you look at the potency of these cells and then introduce them into you into the human body for therapeutic effect so Again, so when you look at like on the left side, I just put like two examples of gene therapy products that have been already approved and they're in market right now. Uh, one is kind of like Lextrana and uh, Dolzenzana. And it's kind of like AV adeno associated viruses. Uh, these are have been a common viral vectors that have been approved for the market. And where, uh, the first one is for the retinal disease. You topically apply this product onto retinal disease, whereas for the AAV, it's a, for the smooth muscular atrophy. Uh, in, when you come and look at like cell therapy products, you have Chimera, uh, Kimraya, Kimraya, which is like the acute uh, for the acute lymphatic um, leukemia, and Escata for the B cell lymphoma. So it's kind of expected that like uh, by 2030. Uh, they will be like around 60 to uh, 30 to 60 gene therapy to cell therapy products like treating patients. So like before we talk about potency assays, I would like to introduce like the a drug product life cycle and analytical development, how analytical development plays a key role in this process. So for the tech development process, ideally you start as a preclinical. Once you have an idea, you start with preclinical and you kind of like move on to phase one, phase two, phase three. And at phase three is kind of you're getting your drug uh, through approval and you go for market. And you kind of put the same in kind of like a development developmental cycle. Uh, the preclinical and phase one to phase two are still considered as early phase, early stage development. That's where you kind of work with the R and D, and you're doing all this initial uh, transfer to kind of like looking at the safety of the product and efficacy of the product. And once you move into late stage, it's kind of like bigger clinical trials where you really understand the drug uh, for multiple populations and really look at efficacy and get like more data on that. Once you have good efficacy, you go into like commercial. So you can also look at the same life cycle based on kind of manufacturing. So you look at manufacturing, what we see is like initial, uh, all is called as research and development. Once you have a good product, you move into like engineering GMP runs. And as you go into phase three, it's kind of, they call it like clinical uh, good manufacturing. And then once you establish your methods for manufacturing your drug, you move into commercial manufacturing. At this stage, you already have like a BLA file and you got a good approach from an FDA. And you look the same cycle on an analytical end. So analytical end, pretty much like all the preclinical and the phase one is completely like you spend a lot of time really is kind of defining the essays and designing the essays evaluating them and optimizing them. And once you really optimize, you find like the right uh, kind of parameters for the assay to really give you the right uh, output, you kind of qualify the assay in which like, you know, the qualification normally happens for phase one. And once you qualify these assays, really understanding the specificity, linearity, accuracy of the assay, you kind of move into like validation, which is primarily important for the phase three, uh, where you kind of like really understand the essay of essay robustness and like you start testing, like uh, really defining the criteria of the essay, like where does this essay uh, acceptance criteria really play? And you really stringently log them up for validation. 
and then once your drug went to commercial you always do a verification so it's kind of like you always run the assay in the same conditions and you have always have an acceptance criteria and the assay has to work in that acceptance criteria that's kind of verification so a complete uh, product uh, drug product life cycle and analytical development looking from a drug product side and once you want to look at like from a cell and gene therapy product so what are the critical quality attributes from an analytical standpoint we ideally look for so for a cell and gene therapy product these are complex products so what FDA has suggested is kind of like, you know, they, we kind of have uh, class attributes and there is a quality attribute. So a class attribute really defines uh, what is the parameter you need to identify. Uh, whereas the quality attribute really gives you is kind of like, what is that specific to that attribute of uh, class attribute? So the first one would be really, is kind of identity. So when you have like a cell or gene therapy product, you really have to identify the product itself. So a simple example would be, okay, you have like an adeno-associated virus. So you kind of really understand the virus genome and the phenotype. Let's consider it has multiple serotypes. So you say like AAV2, you really understand the phenotype is like AAV2 through a, a specific protein technology like using ELISA. And you also look at the genome. So the genome identity is like, okay, you have a specific transgene in it. So you ideally use PCR technologies to really show that like your specific product is carrying the exact transgene and the phenotype. So the identity itself is almost every time is product specifics because you change your transgene and your serotype. So the second attribute is kind of like the purity and impurities. So when you create this, your cell or gene therapy product, ideally you don't want to really put like a, like a, uh, you, you always have to really put a pure product into uh, preclinical farm talk studies or kind of like clinical studies. So at that point, like what we are really looking at here is really understanding what is the product quantity? How much pure is your product? Is, uh, is like, Again, coming to the same, uh, using an AAV as an example here. So what you really look at is like, okay, how many uh, the production particles or like how many of them are full or empty? And then you start looking into kind of like, uh, is the product aggregated? Or like what are the other impurities that the product brings it during the whole purification process or the production process? So there are different methods actually. So one, the genomic method, PCR-based methods are completely heavily used and protein-based uh, methods are heavily used in, in this case. And we also use like multiple physical methods which ideally identify the size of the particle. Uh, uh, so based on like DLS is one example where people use a lot to really define the aggregation. So, so the purity and the impurity is or a, play a very critical role. A simple guidance FDA gives is like, once the product is going into like a clinical, uh, a clinical lot, so what they claim is like, you should ideally have like 10 nanograms of dose, uh, less amount of like DNA. So what it really means is like, a the product should be pure enough in such a way that like whatever external residual plasmid or host cell DNA should be less than 10 nanograms per dose. Uh, and they also look at the size of the fragments that are really floating around, they should be below 200 base pairs. So and again, this is what FDA gives, and this might change. These are the guidances for now. So these are most of the guidances we get from like the antibody field. So, and the other area, when you have this product of cell and gene would be safety. So in which like you kind of really look at like, you know, you're not really adding uh, the clinical lot itself doesn't carry any of the microbial contamination. That's where you again use kind of like PCR based methods, genomic PCR based methods, protein methods and microbial growth also. 
So in which like you really are looking at like endotoxin is a critical thing. You look at like and mycoplasma. So mycoplasma. So these are all produced in mammalian cells. So you have a chance of like mycoplasma contamination. And when you look at cell therapy products, you 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 ideally want your cells to be like not oncogenic or tumorigenic. So they should be like you should have a specific PCR-based method to show that like your cell product is safe and where most of your cells have, are not tumorigenic. So potency is a very critical attribute. So where it really defines kind of like the exact uh, the ability of the product to produce a therapeutic effect. So in that case, normally there are like different uh, genomic methods. Uh, PCR is one of that, and you have a lot of cell-based methods here. So some of the quality attributes given out would be like for gene therapy, it would be the functional titer of the vector, uh, a specific transgene expression for cells, or the biologic activity, or Kind of like the efficacy of the product itself when you really look at like uh, a CAR T cells, like you really look at like how much uh, activity they can show to kill like these uh, receptor specific activated cells. So, again, this is guidance is always like product specific and product quality also plays a very important role. So, you ideally want to have like your appearance, like the pH and the osmolality, or a few things you really look at like. And we normally use like physical physical methods to really determine that. So your pH guidance uh, from FDA would be like 6.5 to 8 when it goes into a clinical law. So uh, for today's talk, we'll focus more on potency actually. So so like FDA provided a huge document uh, for potency. How do you design potency assays for the cell and gene therapy products. So I kind of like looked into that and really picked up uh, the important text. Like well, the first things you can really see is kind of like, uh, what does FDA really define potency as? The specific, uh, so they claim as this, as the specific ability or capacity of the product uh, as indicated by appropriate laboratory tests or, you know, uh, when you go into control clinical data. So it, the, product itself has to give the intended result from a therapeutic efficacy based result so so the they they so you always start your potency as a development in early phase of clinical investigation because like you ideally put a lot of time in early stage development you have a lead candidate you do some form uh, initial proof of concept study so that's where you try to understand uh, is your product really valid uh, to be a good candidate uh, for further time investigation? So what FDA says is like you must initially start collecting all the data, like the identity, quality, purity, strength, and stability of this product at all phases of your clinical study. Even you're in your form talk studies, you should have your most of these critical attributes being collected. Uh, if you want to take a specific product and really look at potency later. So, again, so as I said, cell and gene therapy products are very complex. So it's it's much easier to define potency for an antibody or a recombinant protein, but like for cell and gene therapy, it's, it's very complex because like it's just uh, the amount of biological attributes that play a role in defining the product to work is is very complex so that's the only reason so a simple example would be if you have a gene therapy product you kind of like it has to go through two biological activities right so one would be like the gene itself had to be transferred to your specific cell of interest and the cell of interest has to start producing your specific protein and that's where you're really getting your potency out. So it's it's, it's multiple steps. Like it's not a straight straight away product. Like a straight away way to define. Uh, like it, it's not so easy to define straight away. So as I said, like it, the biological attributes play a very important role in potency assays. So. 
like where does potency really stand when you want to really develop uh, when you have a product development so you have a lead candidate and you you really want to understand the potency aspect of the lead candidate so ideally there are two areas like you can subdivide potency uh, is like kind of like understood so one would be really is kind of the initial characterization when you start really characterizing your drug product what you really do is kind of you do a lot of you look into a lot of orthogonal methods uh, a simple example here would be like you know when you're written at a viral vector product you really define it from kind of like a physical titer point of view you're looking at maybe some of the genomic dna the titer is carrying and at the same time you also look at from a functional aspect how does the vector itself is able able to really uh, transduce the cells and give you a specific uh, result so at that point like you will be looking at like different orthogonal method and then you kind of like finalize a one of one of few methods so the characterization which normally happens in the early stage will kind of really define what would be the how do you define potency in the later stages that's what it really means so and as said the potency should always from fda guidelines potency should always be a quantitative measure of biological activity uh, a simple example would be like if you have a viral vector you put it uh, do a transduction you have a specific gene of expression let's consider it may be a green fluorescent protein expression of green fluorescent protein is considered to be uh, that output where you start you can understand the potency from the transduction so the initial characterization and initial potency determinations are like they kind of like work in tandem and once you move and really move on to like really so once you define the product so once you're done with the early stage and you have a product which is good to go and at that point like what really comes into play is kind of you have to re really look at like three different aspects of the product the first one would be like the specifications and where you really look at is the stability and the comparability so when i mean stability so is the product itself what you prepared is stable enough and really it maintains its potency or not so does it really after like long term storage can the product act as it's initially produced that's kind of that really means as stability so it's very complex for this cell and gene therapy products because like this these are complex products these are not uh, simple proteins so these stability studies play a very important role for potency determinations for uh, lot releases and again so these studies also really help to define the product consistency and the process itself so uh, the way you're purifying the product uh, do you need to change anything to increase the stability these are all questions that comes into play when you're really dealing with cell and gene therapy products and comparability so comparability is kind of like you have kind of like released a lot but later what you observed was kind of like uh, you change the process so you have to have kind of this product uh, you have to save them in such a way that like you comparing lot a to lot b because of the different processes and showing them they have the same potency in such a way that like you can submit this documentation for fda to really show that like your product really the process doesn't really affect the product itself so the critical communication for potency always comes from these in vivo studies where the efficacy and the in vivo effect of the product is so once you do initial uh, proof of concept studies or then you start doing some kind of like uh, when i say uh, like proof of concept and the form a uh, formula form talk studies you really understand is kind of like what is the right dose uh, of this g7 gene therapy products where that you get like a very good kind of like um, therapeutic benefit 
So the dose itself is always undetermined with these cell and gene therapy products because of uh, because of the the pro the product how the product will act in vivo is always a good challenging area for the cell and gene therapy products. And the most important thing of like early development as process development as and the in vivo is really you need to understand the mechanism of action of the specific product. So what FDA really requests is like you really need to understand the mechanism of action of the product to define the potency. So uh, in 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 case like you you're not able to give them the right information of the mechanism of action, the product might not get the approval as needed. So potency is heavily dependent on the mechanism of action of the product. So it's ideal to really define that mechanism of action from the initial stages itself. Try to understand the mechanism of action because as I said, gene therapy products or cell therapy products are complex and they have to go through with these biological attributes. So the mechanism of action is always complex to understand, but it's 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 ideal to define a good potency assay. So what are the desired characteristics for a potency assay? So as I, I showed you was kind of like, where does the potency aspect fit in the whole product as, uh, product development? So there are a couple of uh, interesting like attributes that should be really taken into consideration for potency assay performance. So always, as I said, FDA request for like quality, uh, qualitative results, which is kind of like they need something kind of like measurable results. That's what they want. And you should able to always establish an acceptance criteria, even in an early stage or in later stage. So that is very critical for a potency assay performance. And as I said, a batch to batch consistency, you prepared a lot uh, a, lot B, with a different process, you just have to show that like your product is acting similarly with both the lots and gives you the same consistent uh, therapeutic benefit. That's where your potency assay is like more robust. And as I said, I stressed this previously, but I want to say, so mechanism of action of the product should be clearly understood for potency assay, so then it's, it's much easier uh, to get the approval. Uh, the predict, so another one would be like, so you should have some kind of systems in vitro and in such a way that like you always can predict the efficacy, a clinical efficacy. So a simple example would be most of the time uh, when you look at a cell therapy product from a, a CAR T, most of the things we look at is kind of really looking at the vector copy number as a critical attribute, as well as you look at the production of kind of like uh, cytokines, and that's where you have a high cytokine, a specific value of cytokine can always correlate very nicely with the clinical efficacy on an in vitro system. So, and sensitivity and specificity enough to detect the changes and degradation. So, your assay should be able to show in, in any long-term study or like you do long-term stability studies, if the product has been degraded, it really has to identify that uh, from a potency assay point of view. So, that's very critical for long-term stability, long-term storage of the product. So, you have an assay that can really identify the ability of the product. And the other one would be, so the, as I said, when you have a cell lot gene therapy product, you always, uh, the purity always is not 100%. But you really, the potency assay should be able to differentiate between the product and the impurity. So it, it really has to show if you have high impurity, it should be able to really show that like, you know, uh, lower potency because of the impurity presence. So that's what it really means. So. It, it should be very specific at the same time, it should really show you like if the product purity is not really good. So there are multiple challenges to develop these potency assays. So as I said, uh, these potency assays for cell and gene, 
the raw material plays a very important role. So initially, right now, there is not really standardized raw material still because the product itself is a complex product. So you have to use different sources of raw material. Uh, so there's an inherent variability of starting material. And at the same time, you really don't have the appropriate reference material. And it's very hard sometimes because you're really creating uh, product specific very so it's very hard to create like reference material for each product so again the examples where the in variability comes from starting material would be like you consider cell therapy it can be from donor so the donor variability so you get a donor for lot a a donor change for lot b so the variability can be there again when you look at like ipsc cell line which is used to differentiate and create like uh, cell therapy products, your cell line heterogeneity plays a very important role. Like that's very important. It should be clonal. So that's a very important thing. And the other would be like when you really look at itself from um, virus production, you consider like adenosine virus or antiviruses. You you should be very carefully understanding the product itself because like you have a product where you might have like most of your pack AAV can have genomic DNA. So th these are things we should be understanding better. And another thing would be limitation. As I said, you for potency assess, you have to have lot like a storage of lots, whatever you produce. But it's a small volume that for single dose therapies. So it's always hard to really maintain these lots, a uh, small volume of sample because the vol your your whole product itself uh, will be mostly sufficient for your study. So it's it's the limitation itself is like how much product you produce can be completely used for your study. So uh, the production itself is always a challenge to really define the potency assay and multiple active reagents. So so this comes from mostly like kind of like a simple example here would be like you have kind of like cells which need activation. So you might have to add other reagents like peptides to keep these cells active uh, in a cell therapy product. So it, it it's very hard at, in sometimes because the peptides or the quality of the peptide can really affect uh, affect your potency assay. So that should be understood very better. Uh, and again, you kind of like use multiple cell, cell lines sometimes to create like a final product. So another would be multiple vectors. A simple example would be like you have a transgene A with an AV and then you have transgene B. You need both of them to work in a therapeutic uh, to the therapeutic benefit. So you just mix them and really give them uh, for the to carry out the trial. So this should be really understood better. And those are big challenges, like for kind of like for potency assay. Uh, another one would be like the complex mechanism of action. So as I said, it's multiple steps, right? So you have to have your infection done. Then the genome should be like uh, integrated to access to show the expression. So these are each step. Is, itself can affect your uh, potency assay. So they're like, you just have to understand the right cell lines or right mechanism of how your product really works. That's a very important area. And so, as I said, always the in vivo fate of the product is not always uh, the same. So you can be using a batch of mice and when it can give you a good result, but like after like uh, you go to a second batch of mice, you might not get the same results because like the there are a lot of factors, biological attributes that can really change. So again, this the way you give the product also plays an important role. Like, is it like a very trophic or it's going to be an in vivo? So these all things come into play. And another thing would be immunogenicity. Let's consider like you have always have uh, these products can always not be tolerated by 
these animal models. So you, we just have to understand better. So there are like multiple challenges uh, for this potency assay development. So I'll, I'll quickly jump into like two case studies where one is from gene therapy. So this uh, this paper from Avson is from gene therapy. So so the, what they the the paper was came out last year. So what they did here was like they kind of like developed an in vitro potency assay for adeno associated viruses, uh, which specifically encodes a trans gene that has the ability to reduce bilirubin. So what they did here was kind of like their initial uh, proof of concept studies have been done in mice and they kind of selected the AAV specific vector which has the trans gene. And as to reduce the animal studies, they, wa they wanted to develop kind of like an in vitro potency assay. So the first thing they did was kind of really looked at different cell models, cell line models, where they can actually mimic the similar situation that's happening in a mice. So what they found was kind of like they found a cell line, which is the HIVIC cell, HUH7 cells, which have the ability that the AAV8 can really transduce them with the flow cytom. Uh, the transgene expression was confirmed through flow cytometry. And they also used a bilirubin conjugation assay to show that like uh, the specific transgene they're expressing was able to actually capture the bilirubin that's been provided in the media. So, and what they really claim was kind of like they correlated nicely across different constructs. At the same time, they also showed across different vector loads. So the graph on the left, what really shows A and B is kind of like they they tested two different constructs, uh, which is called C, CO1 and CO2. And what they're really showing here is that when you have a higher dose, both the wild type and the CO1 actually mimic, uh, has good uh, therapeutic effect, whereas the CO2, which is a different construct, doesn't really happen, doesn't really, work as expected. So the same kind of like uh, is mimicked in dose two and in low dose also. And they went ahead and looked at like the vector copy number and they really see kind of like the very low vector copy number. I think that they looked at like the integrations and they clearly show like it, it shows like higher integrations uh, in D. Uh, whereas CO1 really doesn't really show much. And then they're actually showing here um, E and F is kind of the in, v, in vitro potency. So what they did was like they took the same uh, constructs and they applied them on the in vitro system. And what they're really showing here is like the CO1 really uh, mimicking similar to what you see in in vitro, uh, in vivo efficacy. So, so through this, what they claim is kind of like whatever they see in vivo is nicely correlated to the in vitro potency on the cell system. So, and they also they, they also showed was kind of like they produced the same different lots in two different production systems where they are showing like H, uh, like. HCK suspension cell line and the back low virus of this AAV. And when they ideally kind of like send, put them in in vivo, they actually saw a little bit of difference between both the lots and which ideally was picked up uh, by the in vitro system with this small uh, increase. So that's what they are trying to show here. So uh, at the end of the day, what, it, what they claim is kind of like, this is kind of like an in vitro potency assay which kind of mimicking this viral vector, uh, which is very, again, this is product specific vector. So that's what uh, we've been, dis I discussed previously. So you always have to look and identify the right cell line in such a way that like it will be more applicable to kind of your own product specific thing. So 
the other case study I put up here from is from cell therapy. So this was produced in uh, this paper was produced in 2019, where in this case what they really were talk, uh, showing here is kind of like when you really want to identify the potency of this um, primary antigen T cells, uh, people really use is kind of like um, two different ways. You use a killing assay. Uh, which is always not real time. It's an endpoint assay most of the time. And we also have to use like labeled fluorophores to really understand, read out the specific killing activity and which normally was found to increase the background noise. So in this assay, what they used was kind of like, uh, they used this excelligence real time cell analysis system. And what is, the way it works really is kind of like you plate your target cells, uh, then you go with your effector cells, which are your CAR T cells. And when ideally, when you have these cells, the chip on the bottom has the ability to transfer less electricity because of more cells have been sticking to the cell. As the CAR T cells show the effector function and kill the regular cells, uh, the higher ability of uh, current transfer happens and that's what is mimicked uh, in this graph. So you have like a higher current transfer, it's really showing like effector cells, uh, kind of like it just uh, sh shows everything died out. So there's a more high current being produced. So whereas the control, it just stays normal. It doesn't really, uh, no change in current, that's what it really means. So that's that's what it really means by impedance. So what they did here was like they had a mock trans used, which is in blue color and like the specific CD47 CAR T cells, which has the ability to identify pancreatic cells and kill them up. And they're using T cells itself and they're just using the pancreatic cancer cell line itself. So when you ideally have the pancreatic cell line and your CAR T, which is the CD47, you see that whole uh, nice curve where the others, others are controls where you don't see that uh, killing activity. And they also use kind of the control where they kind of like media itself and CAR T cells where you don't really see any uh, kind of change in current. So I mean, this, is, this is kind of like a very good, a simple in vitro potency assay that has been developed. And this, this uh, uh, the the one thing they haven't shown in this paper was like how do you relate this to the in vivo efficacy of the CAR T cells and in the field itself people have mostly uh, killing activity always doesn't really correlate to the in vivo efficacy most of the time it's kind of like your production of cytokines uh, show that efficacy uh, that's 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 a good relation in CAR T field. So anyway, so moving on. So I would finally end saying that like, you know, uh, the potency as a development timeline and strategy, where you want to really invest uh, in your strategy would be like, as I said, you have three clinical phase one, phase three, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three and commercial. And when you look at like an essay point of view, development, qualification and validation, right? So when you really put the strategy for potency assays, what you ideally have to do is kind of like, you know, the first initial development phase is kind of really understand uh, till release of the drug, understand the expression, really understand uh, is the specific transient really expressed uh, for a viral vector or for a cell therapy. You just have to understand is the specific uh, transient is expressing and can it really show any kind of activity. As you move into qualification where you kind of like you're into moving into phase two and phase three, where you kind of come back and really correlate everything back to your mechanism of action. Uh, and that's where you say like, okay, this is the mechanism of action or where the potency is coming from. And then you always also show expression of, of your transgene. But when you go to commercial and validation, you always show them mostly the mechanism of action with potency. And that's where you really define this acceptance criteria of the product. 
okay, so this is the range where the product is really active and it'll give you the uh, kind of your therapeutic benefit. So I mean, potency assays are not easy. There are multiple challenges with the cell and kind of like the cell and gene therapy area. And as the field evolves, we will kind of like establish more good reliable controls for these potency assays. Uh, so I have a bunch of literature here uh, to if you, anybody interested in it. So this is pretty much like all the FDA guidances when you want to really develop potency assays. And finally, I would end with saying uh, acknowledge the areas where I gained all this knowledge from uh, through like my school in uh, Texas a and University, Lonza and Sana. And yeah, thank you.